Suntem aici la grupul pentru dialog social în această dezbatere pe care o organizăm dumneavoastră cu revista 22 și cu Expert Forum cu participarea unor reprezentanți importanți din ambasadele acreditate în România, în primul rând excelența sa, Ivor Prokopciuc, ambasadorul Ucrainei. Salut pe reprezentantul ambasadei Statele Unite. Avem reprezentanți de la Ministerul de Externe, domnul Dan Iancu, de la Ministerul Muncii și avem asociații care uh, au organizat și organizează uh, viața refugiaților ucraineni în România. Nu credeam să ajungem să uh, punctăm doi ani de la agresiunea Rusiei asupra Ucrainei și uh, dacă ne stăm să ne gândim bine, ar trebui să punctăm 10 ani de la data de 23 februarie 2014, când Rusia a invadat peninsula Crimea. Vedem zilele astea și suntem stupefiați, toată Europa e stupefiată, de felul în care a fost tratat și un disident important din Rusia lui Vladimir Putin, care după ce a fost omorât, Uh, asistăm zilele astea după cum există o dispută și în jurul trupului, în jurul cadavrului lui. Avem impresia că ne întoarcem în uh, tragedia greacă în Antigona, când tiranul refuză ultimele onoruri date cadavrului disidentului său. Creon. Cunoaștem această această legendă, acest, acest mit fundamental al europenității. Tiranul care împinge tirania nu numai până la a-și omorâ adversarul, dar uh, și până la a-i bat jocorii trupul. Suntem aici ca să ne amintim de sutele de mii de ucraineni care au fost supuși unei teribile tragedii. Moartea, desărarea, delocalizarea, pierderea familiei, pierderea joburilor, a copiilor, despărțirea familiilor, deruta vieții în străinătate, într-o țară sau în țări ale căror limbi nu le cunosc sau le cunosc prea puțin, într-un peizaj pe care trebuie să și îl îmblânzească încet, încet. Din fericire, România este o țară de azil, e o țară de primire și a fost o țară de primire din primele zile ale agresiunii Rusiei în Ucraina. România și-a deschis granițele pentru emigrația ucraineană. Populația României a primit cu brațele deschise pe ucraineni, poate chiar înainte ca guvernul României să ia toate măsurile necesare, firești, umane, pentru a primi pe acești oameni care au trebuit să-și părăsească țara. Iată că se împlinesc mâine doi ani de la aceste cumplite evenimente, doi ani în care uh, Ucraina, ca țară, a apărat zi de zi valorile Europei. Doi ani în care Ucraina a arătat că este Europa, că apără Europa și că reprezintă valorile europene ca o barieră în calea tiraniei a totalitarismului, a dictaturii. Suntem aici, deci, să omagiem Ucraina și pe ucraineni pentru rezistența și eroismul de care dau dovadă, 
pentru ceea ce fac, pentru a ne proteja pe noi toți europenii în calea invaziei barbare a tiraniei. L-am invitat pe uh, excelența sa, ambasadorul Ucrainei, să fie alături de noi. L-am întâmpinat cu steagul Ucrainei la intrare, pe una cu steagul României și cu steagul Europene. Uh, sunt zile deosebit de grele, asistăm cu toții la felul în care decurg ostilitățile, în care uh, soldații ucraineni rezistă eroic cu armament din ce în ce mai puțin la asaltul teribil uh, al uh, vrăjmașului și al, al uh, invadatorului rus. Aceste secvențe ne aduc aminte cu siguranță de episoade teribile din istoria României, în care și noi am fost supuși unor agresiuni neașteptate, tot atât de violente, și în care am găsit sprijin în alte țări care ne-au apărat și ne-au uh, luat partea. De acest lucru are nevoie și Ucraina astăzi. Și dacă ne-am adunat aici, este pentru a da un semnal că societatea civilă românească este alături de Ucraina și de Ucraine. Suntem destul de mulți astăzi. Grupul pentru dialog social urmărește foarte atent situația din Ucraina. Prin revista 22 și aveți pe masă câteva numere din cursul acestor doi ani în care contributorii revistei, analiști politici, oameni din societatea civilă, au scris regulat, au atras atenția asupra pericolului dictaturii și au reflectat cât au putut de fidel cu informațiile pe care le-au avut situația de pe front și situația politică în care Ucraina se află. Grupul pentru dialog social a dat anul trecut premiul CDS, un premiu prestigios, premiul anual pe anul de dinainte, lui Radu Hosu, care este unul din uh, oamenii care a uh, sfidat orice fel de regulă a prudenței uh, și a mers inclusiv în prima linie a frontului ca să ducă ajutoare, să participe cu, uh, cu ajutoare bănești sau uh, materiale cu dotări, cu utilități la efortul uh, soldaților uh, ucraineni aflați pe front. Uh, o să-l vedem și pe el în seara asta, aici. Deci, Grupul pentru Dialog Social este o uh, organizație foarte atentă la uh, situația din Ucraina și nu este întâmplător că astăzi ne-am adunat cu toți aici să uh, comemorăm acești doi ani triști de agresiune, dar și efortul eroic al ucrainenilor de a rezista în numele valorilor europene și în numele unui ideal național. Cum suntem destul de mulți, am să vă propun ordinea următoare pentru cuvânt și o să vă rog să încercați să păstrați o anumită rigoare, o anumită disciplină pentru a putea vorbi cât mai mulți. Am să-i dau întâi cuvântul excelenței sale, ambasadorului Ucrainei. După aceea, aș vrea să rog să vorbească pe reprezentanții asociațiilor și organizațiilor care desfășoară activități în favoarea refugiaților ucraineni. După aceea, aș vrea să dau cuvântul reprezentanților guvernamentali care sprijină în felul lor aceste eforturi și cred că e și o ocazie astăzi ca în mijlocul nostru, al vostru, să afle mai mult despre dificultățile pe care refugiații ucraineni le întâmpină în continuare în încercarea lor de a duce o viață cât mai normală, cât mai firească pe acest pământ de azil, pământ de găzduire. Și după aceea aș vrea să îi rog pe analiști politici, membrii GDS, persoane care au urmărit de aproape conflictul, 
să spună fiecare părerea lor și să se alăture, să se poziționeze față de aceste mesaje. Vă reamintesc că Grupul pentru Dialog Social este o organizație uh, critică care uh, își propune să medieze între cetățeni și stat, între cetățeni și uh, administrație, astfel încât să aducă la cunoștința opiniei publice și a administrației problemele reale din societate. Aceasta este medierea cu care a fost înființat și acest, acest lucru continuă să-l facă până astăzi. So, Your Excellency, if you can speak a word. Um, uh, good evening. I will, I will, I will speak in English, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, for uh, dedicating uh, tonight's debate to. Uh, this mark of two years since Russia's full-scale invasion into Ukraine. And uh, I want to thank for the invitation to participate in this discussion and uh, the suggestion that I noted from the invitation letter to deliver some messages from, from Ukraine and from the Ukrainian people. I very much appreciate this opportunity. Um, as was rightly noted, uh, Although tomorrow will mark uh, two years since uh, the full-scale invasion. In fact, the Russian aggression against Ukraine started 10 years ago, also uh, in, the, uh, in the end of February. It was uh, on the 26th of uh, February 2014 when people in Crimea, across Ukraine, they woke up and either saw by their own eyes or saw the photographs of uh, soldiers without uh, insignia seizing the administrative buildings in, in Crimea, uh, surrounding the military installations across Crimea and lining up the streets of the peninsula. At that time we, we heard very strong denials from Russian political leadership about belonging of those uh, uh, green men and still we heard these uh, denials until uh, the sham referendum that was organized by the Russian occupation forces and later an attempted annexation of Crimea. The developments of 10 years ago were the first instance in Europe's history since uh, the end of World War II, when one European state attempted annexation of the territory of another state by military force. It did not happen uh, in Europe since uh, the end of World War II, and we had this first such instance. Uh, why we emphasize this point? Because uh, the reaction of the international community to the attempted annexation of Crimea was not adequate to the gravity of the violation of international law. And therefore it was seen by Putin, by Moscow, as a weakness of the world community in reacting to a land grab by force uh, that was committed by the Moscow regime. And therefore, after the events of uh, February, March 2014, we saw the expansion of the aggression into the eastern parts of Ukraine, into Donbass. It's not a secret to anyone that uh, the uh, activities, the illegal activities uh, in the eastern parts of Ukraine then were uh, organized and uh, were masterminded and were fueled uh, from Moscow with the uh, specific individuals or the armaments provided uh, from the Russian Federation. And uh, it was two years ago that uh, when the attempts to subverse uh, Ukraine's course towards uh, Europe, towards the European Union, towards NATO, that uh, this uh, full-scale invasion 
was launched. As we mark now the, the two years, we first of all note the remarkable courage and bravery and heroism and self-sacrifice of the Ukrainian people who stood up to the challenge uh, immediately uh, after the first day of the invasion. It was uh, indeed remarkable how uh, the people across the society got united, the volunteers who were joining the armed forces, the uh, territorial defense units that were set up across the country, and the struggle that was uh, mounted to uh, fend off the Russian invasion. Uh, it was a very large force, uh, striking from different directions, from uh, the north, from the east, from the south, uh, tens of thousands, with uh, military strikes across the, the country. Uh, it was only later that uh, we found out the uh, despicable atrocities that uh, the Russian occupiers were committing on the territories they occupied. And it is now the, the names that are known worldwide, the names of Bucha, near Kiev, Irpin, uh, later Izum, in Kharkiv Oblast with uh, mass burial places of uh, 400 people, and until now, not all of them have been identified. We are now continue to witness the, the towns and cities, which basically are totally destroyed, like the recent one, uh, Avdiivka, which are basically made uh, uninhabitable. Uh, and this is this uh, horrible image of uh, what we would call the Russian world, the true face of the Russian world and the de destruction it brings. The city of Abdivka, which now does look like a ghost town, was the town that uh, uh, had uh, over 30,000 people of population who lived there, who raised their kids, who were going to school, and people uh, cared about their daily lives. And now it's, uh, it's entirely, totally destroyed. We all witnessed this uh, uh, enormous humanitarian crisis of uh, displacement of millions of Ukrainians. Uh, it was at the very beginning that over 10 million people left their places of residence. Uh, some of them moved inside the country and millions moved across the border to, to other countries. Millions entered the Ukrainian or cross the Ukrainian-Romanian territory, entering uh, the territory of this country. Uh, and uh, from the meetings that uh, I had since my arrival with uh, Ukrainian citizens, I know how much they appreciate the uh, reception, the warmth, the comfort, and the empathy they experienced upon arrival to Romania. Um, and of course, we, uh, as authorities of the Ukrainian state, I uh, express profound appreciation to all groups of uh, Romanian society for the support and empathy extended to Ukrainians in this uh, moment of uh, extreme hardship and um, uh, existential challenge. Um, Thousands and thousands of crimes have been committed on the Ukrainian territory. War crimes, crimes against humanity, crimes of uh, genocide. And for us it is very important to make sure that uh, the perpetrators of these crimes are brought to justice. Because otherwise uh, we will not be able to establish an international system of uh, uh, security unless we, we uh, uh, make sure that there is no impunity for, for these grave uh, crimes that have been committed. And this includes also uh, the uh, responsibility for the crime of aggression that was committed by uh, the uh, higher political leadership of uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, 
Neither in 2014, when the Russians first invaded into Crimea, nor in uh, 2022, when they launched the full-scale invasion, there were no pretexts at all to uh, uh, commit such a blatant violation of uh, uh, international law, but also the borders of an independent, sovereign, peaceful European state. It was all concocted in the minds of the leaders of the Russian regime. And uh, it also shows why this regime poses such a grave security threat to all nations of Europe. They do not require a pretext or a reason to attack. They decide whom they would attack, and they decide based on uh, a mythical interpretation of history of uh, which nations they uh, have the right to kind of drive into submission. Um, I fully agree with the lines said before about the dictatorship, about the uh, tyranny uh, and uh, uh, barbarism that uh, we uh, witness from uh, the Russian regime. And um, as I was speaking these, uh, yes, as today, uh, earlier today and yesterday, I particularly note that uh, the combat line uh, now has uh, the length of uh, over 1,000 kilometers. It's uh, similar to a distance from Bucharest to Kiev. And this is the line that now separates uh, this tyranny, this uh, 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 dictatorship, uh, from what the Ukrainian forces are defending, the uh, values of uh, European civilization and the values of democracy. It is absolutely imperative that we maintain uh, our unity as uh, democracies, as European nations in defending this line, but also in making sure that we can win this war, that we can push it back to the borders uh, of Russia, to the borders of Ukraine, and uh, together we, through our action, uh, make sure that uh, what we stand for uh, is uh, really reflected uh, in the situation uh, on the ground. Um, we are going through a difficult phase. It's now uh, two years. The challenges uh, remain big. While we remember what has been happening over the past two years, it's also important to be aware that this brutal and fierce war continues every day. There are constantly everyday attacks taking place uh, at the combat line, but also the attacks on Ukrainian cities and towns across the country. It was only last night that again a few cities were attacked, in particular Odessa, and there are again uh, civilian victims. And therefore, we uh, need to maintain the unity, but also perseverance in terms of standing up uh, to the aggression uh, to attain uh, our, our victory. This is, this is uh, in our view, a, a decisive moment for uh, the history on the European continent, just like there were other continents uh, 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 moments uh, of historic significance uh, in the past. So this is one of them which will largely de uh, uh, determine the evolution of events uh, in Europe uh, for this century. It is the dictatorship versus democracy and um, it will decide how the situation will, will further develop. We have full confidence in the strength 
of uh, democratic countries in the strength of democratic processes and in our ability to prevail over the aggressor state. Ukraine has shown uh, in these past two years that although the adversary is, uh, is formidable, uh, it is a country that claimed that it had uh, the second strongest army in the world. We have by now dispelled this myth. We have shown that Ukrainian forces can win. We have liberated nearly 50% of the territory of Ukraine that was initially occupied by the invasion force. We have uh, destroyed or put out of service a large part of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Uh, when the Russians started the war, they had um, 13 big landing ships in the Black Sea, including those that were, that were brought in from the Baltic before the invasion. Today, they have five in service. Other four have been destroyed by Ukrainian forces, and four have been damaged and are now in repair. Ukrainian forces have destroyed the so-called flagship of uh, uh, the Russian Black Sea Fleet, a vessel called Moskva, Moscow, uh, in April of 2022, and it sank uh, in the Black Sea. And uh, uh, these gains uh, of Ukrainian forces, again, have showed uh, the ability to win and also the skill that uh, our people, uh, our military have uh, in terms of operating different kinds of uh, equipment, military equipment that is procured to, to the forces. We continue to very much depend on it. The, the experience of this uh, uh, past year shows that uh, the Russians have uh, very big uh, stocks of uh, weapons and ammunition. Uh, we will not be able to, to have an advantage in numerical terms uh, in relation to, to the pieces of artillery uh, or ammunition. But where we can have an advantage, and it is the, the the technological advantage, it is the advantage in terms of the uh, uh, high tech that is uh, used uh, to, uh, to uh, suppress the Russian, the Russian forces. Uh, this is what we, what we will continue to do. Currently, Ukraine's expectations uh, relate in terms of priorities to the uh, air defense forces. This is, uh, this is what we need, air defense systems because that helps to save lives of, uh, of civilians, uh, in, in, again, in, in cities across the country. We expect that very soon uh, our forces will be using F-16 aircraft. That is, again, something that will help to deprive the Russians of their advantage in the, in the air. We uh, rely that there will be sufficient supplies of the ammunition. As for now, uh, recently, uh, there was a, a shortage of uh, such supplies. Uh, important thing is that we continue to stick together, that there is solidarity with my country and uh, the common purpose, the common purpose of prevailing the aggressor and uh, re-establishment of peace that would be a just peace and would recognize uh, the rules that underpin peace and security in Europe and worldwide. Um, so, um, as I speak uh, uh, on this occasion of two years of uh, uh, Ukraine's uh, heroic resistance, I would like also to conclude my remarks by saying Slava Ukraini, we will, we will win, we will prevail, and thank you very much again for the support and this discussion that takes place now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador, for the... Thank you for delivering us the message of the Ukrainian people.
it was very important and very significant for us. Do you have to add something? No. Okay. So uh, I will uh, uh, give the floor to Sorin Yonitsa, uh, who will present us some figures of the Ukrainian organizations with, who uh, organize the life of, Ukra of the Ukrainian refugees in Romania. Thank you. And not only, I will speak um, in English briefly to his uh, task of interpretation for the diplomatic courts and the friends from Ukraine. Um, I actually have three very brief points. First, to reinforce this idea that we are today marking 10 years of war and two years of full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So it is not very appropriate to say two years of war because there were military and civilians who died in the eight years before February 2022. Um, and uh, the, the date actually when Putin decided to give the order to invade Crimea is precisely today, 23rd of February. 2014, according to some documents and leaks. My uh, second point is an advertisement. Uh, there is a meeting, a public rally tomorrow organized by the Ukrainian community in Bucharest. Uh, it starts at 2 o'clock in Piazza Victoriae and it will be a march, a very beautiful march, Ukrainian embassy, and it will end up in front of the Russian embassy with a protest. And my invitation is for everybody to join it to show the Ukrainian communities that we are with them. Deci, mâine este meeting, ora două piața Victoriei, se merge protest în fața ambasadei Rusiei, acolo se termină și pentru One Media va fi o ocazie foarte frumoasă pentru vizuale, vremea excelentă, 20 de grade, toată lumea poate veni cu biciclete, cu căței. E o ocazie foarte bună să ne arătăm solidaritatea cu ei și să nu fie doar un meeting al comunității ucrainiene. Ei sunt organizatorii, dar oricine poate veni. And my third point is uh, actually the point of my presence here. I'm from Expert Forum, and as an NGO, we were part of a network of NGOs who supported Ukraine in all these years, uh, in all these, in, in these two years, uh, with a community of uh, Ukrainians who are here present in Romania, but also shipping over aid to, uh, over the border to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, this was an opportunity to meet people uh, to talk to them, to try to help them, those who are present here. And in this uh, capacity, uh, we came to know what kind of problems they have. And this is my point today. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we have some representative of the Romanian government. My message is that for more than one year, the situation of Ukrainian refugees in Romania is not so much on the agenda as it used to be at the beginning of the invasion. We don't pay enough attention the support systems of the Romanian state have changed a little bit and we have big problems. They have big problems in accessing services and financial support, which by law is available. So this is a problem with, uh, with the Romanian state. Uh, uh, there are problems with delay in payments, access to medical services, um, there are problems with kids who spend time in Romanian schools, but there's no really an integration or, uh, or time well used. And this is why we invited some people, a representative of the Ukrainian community, which I'm going to introduce now, and they will point out exactly what the problems are. And after this event, we will do what we did last year, which is summarize the problems and try to do advocacy or push them uh, with the Romanian authorities. We had some meetings last year with the Ministry of Labor for Social Problems, with the Ministry of Education for the integration of, uh, of kids in school. But it is not easy because it's not a legal problem. The law exists, they have all rights. The problem is they don't function, as you know. So it's no surprise for Romanians that public institutions don't always function as they should. So we have here today to speak with us, uh, Yulia Osipishina, um, and Ilya Gubernikov. They are uh, very energetic community organizers in the refugee community of Ukrainians in Romania. And they know firsthand, because they experience in their own life, the problems that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about. So I think we should go in this order, Yulia, Ilya, and then we have Romanian civil society organizations who also did a great job, sometimes 
less visible than we were, but they were really great, like Radouciu Civic and probably others, uh, eh, who actually uh, helped people in Romania, but also in Ukraine with humanitarian aid. Yulia, should come in. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. uh, I came from Ukraine from Nikolaev at the beginning of war in March with my family. I had to do it because uh, from the window of my house uh, we saw lots of uh, rockets and bombs. And it was terrible because nobody expected it. So we took uh, only a few bags with us because we were 100% sure that we will go for a week, maximum two somewhere which is close to our border, just to stay and then to come back home. Unfortunately, as we see now, we are almost two years here and we don't know when we will be able to come back home. Uh, so uh, Ukrainians are very thankful for Romanian because uh, now we can stay in peace. This is the most important. Like uh, our kids can play in playground without asking, should we go home when we see a plane? Is it dangerous or not? Um, but unfortunately, as we are staying here for almost two years, we have some problems which I want to mention. The main problem is that um, there is no stability here. Like uh, when we came at the beginning of war, the government made lots of promises. Like they say, uh, you will stay here, we will give you lots of support, like a refugee. So uh, you will stay here like almost at home. But unfortunately, all these promises are very far from reality. So uh, the main problem now is uh, paying for rent, for living. Because there is a pro program from government that if uh, the adult is working and the child is visiting uh, school or kindergarten, then the government will compensate uh, this payment for rent apartment. But unfortunately, the last payment for me for this compensation was in June. Now it's February. So um, it's very hard, you know, to plan your life in another country, and it's the most harder if you don't know what will be tomorrow. Like, if you don't have any specific support and you don't know, like, uh, how you will pay for your apartment tomorrow, and you have a child and you need to take care about him, it's very, very hard. So from our side, we try to do the best. Like we try to integrate, we try to find a job if possible. I will tell about it later because not always it's possible and not always it's uh, up to us that like we don't want to have this uh, job, yes? But even if we do, then we have no guarantees that we will have normal life and that these promises which were made long ago will be okay for now. So the another problem is um, when we got temporary protection, it was told that we will have almost the same rights as Romanians, except we will not be able to vote. So it means almost everything as for Romanians. But unfortunately, it's not like this. Uh, as for me, I have a child who is an autist, and uh, we made official Romanian handicap here. So due to the law, my child should have three types of compensations from government. Uh, unfortunately, now we have only one. It's the least one. It's 210 lei. Uh, another compensation for 1,000 lei, they say it's not for you, because in your temporary protection you don't have your address. And unfortunately, it's impossible to put address in our temporary protection. We have another possibilities to prove our address here, like a contract, but it doesn't work. And another sum for 610 lei, they just ignore it. So rights are not exactly as it should be, yes? And uh, also all Romanian kids, you know, they have uh, money for living from government. So every month they have this payment. Uh, we also applied for this money for my child. We got this money, but in two weeks uh, we got a letter from the government that we need to, take, uh, to give this money back to them because uh, we don't have any rights for this payment. For me, it looks very strange. Like when we work, when we pay the same taxes as Romanians. The same, exactly, yes? But the rights are not the same. So our kids are not the same as kids from Romania. So they don't need uh, some money for living. They need nothing, as, as we see now. Another big problem is with medicine, because um, like everybody knows that if you want to go 
to some uh, doctor, you need to visit first your family doctor. And only with help of family doctor, they can give you some referrals to another doctors. Um, Ukrainian wants to have a family doctor, but it's like a dream. You can try to find this doctor for a year or more because family doctors, Romanian family doctors, they don't want to take Ukrainians. Uh, they give uh, lots of reasons why. Uh, first, it's like we don't have space. We don't have free, free places to take you. That the government uh, doesn't pay money for you. That only kids, uh, your kids, Ukrainian kids, have the right to have free medicine. For adults, you should pay. And even if they take us, they don't want to give us free referrals to any specialist. So they want us to pay for everything. They don't want to give us free prescriptions for medicine, even if it's something serious like pneumonia, for example. And it's very, very hard because, first of all, we don't know language uh, as good enough to be able to talk with the specialists. Then we don't know where to find the specialists because all these clinics are different. So you can't go to any clinic in Bucharest to have this support. You need to go to the exact clinic which will accept you. And it's very, very hard. Also, yes, it's very, very expensive and very, very hard. So my daughter, we tried to make handicap for my daughter for almost a year. The main problem was that the psychologist should speak Russian or Ukrainian language to be able to talk with your child. And there is no such psychologist here. I mean, who can do it? Uh, okay, I say, okay, like, I'm a psychologist. Maybe I will do this. No, you can't because you are a mother. Okay, maybe we will have a translator who will translate from Romanian into Ukrainian and then back. They say, no, it's impossible, because we don't know how this translator will translate. So for one year, my daughter was waiting just to got this handicap because of these problems with language. I think it's not good enough, especially if the child has some, something serious disease, because it's just wasting of time. A uh, huge problem is also with education, as Sorin already mentioned. Like, uh, um, they want our kids to visit schools, yes? But uh, nobody arranged uh, courses, language courses for our kids. We're here for almost two years. I don't know any official Romanian organization who proposed these courses for free for every person from Ukraine. And it's very, very hard to go to school if you don't know language. Like, what will you learn from school? Just, uh, okay, hello, my name is, and that's it. You can't learn subjects, especially if it's not first form, yes? Especially if it's like fifth, sixth, seventh form. You don't understand what teachers are talking about. And you can't understand it in one month, in two months, in three months. So you just spend your time, you just visit school and have nothing there. The same problem is with kindergarten. They don't really want to accept our kids, especially if it's special kids with some problems. They say, we don't have any specialists, to work with your kids, we don't understand what they want. Like they don't behave good enough to stay with other kids. But how they can behave good enough if they don't understand what others are talking about? Like they can't even ask what they want. They can't talk with other kids there at this kindergarten. So what should they do? Just sitting in the corner and playing with one toy for all day because they can't talk with other kids and nobody thought about it before. If there is no problems with language, it would be much easier to do this. So Ukrainians, as you see, they know lots of languages, like not one. Usually they know two or three. So they want to learn Romanian greatly. But unfortunately, there is no possibility. Like if you have a Romanian course two times a week for one hour, it's maximum which I was found here in Bucharest. Usually it's even like one time a week. I'm sure you will not be able to learn Romanian learning it one time a week or two times a week. It's very hard language to be able to learn it so fast, <laughs> you know. So uh, we don't have this possibility to integrate properly because there is no institution who can help us. When people from Ukraine came here, it was very, very hard to integrate because there was no place, like no office, no location we, where we could come and ask for our questions. Every day we have lots of questions, and it's normal because we are in foreign country. 
So when we came, first question was how to get temporary protection, for example, where we can have it, yes? Where we should go? What type of documents we need to have? Then, okay, we got this temporary protection. How we can find a place for living, yes? How we can find a family doctor? In which hospital we can go to have some medical support if it's urgent, for example, yes? Uh, where we should call if we have some problems? No answers. Just you, you should try to find something on the internet. You should try to find maybe some groups in Telegram, in WhatsApp, yeah, in Romania. Yes, when, uh, when you can find some information, if you can. And it's like a quest, you know? Uh, when you don't know where to go, you don't know what to find, you don't know who can help you, and it's extremely hard because you are also very stressed. You came from war. It's not just you came for a vacation and you have a hotel, and you just want to see uh, nice places around, and that's it. You came from war, you have lots of stress, you don't know what to do, because you don't know when you can come back, and you don't know what to do here. It's uh, very, very hard for people also. Yes, and uh, one more thing which I want to say. Uh, as I might have a special daughter, I know this problem from my, my own way, yes? And here's lots of kids with autism, with Down syndrome from Ukraine. And they don't have any support here. The main problem is with language, because nobody understands them. And these kids, they need to have this support every day. If they don't have this support, they have huge regress. They will not have any problems. I was looking for a specialist who can help my daughter for six months. I found only one private organization, Autism Voice, who agreed to work with Ukrainian kids. But, but they accepted only 20 kids, and I personally know more than 100. So there is no possibility for these kids to have any education at all. So they have huge regress, and if it lasts for one week, it's okay, for two weeks, maybe. If it's for two years, it's huge regress for these people, for these kids. And it will be very hard, extremely hard for them to have normal life after they have this huge regress for two years. And I try to visit different organizations, like uh, Safe Children, JRS, almost all of them which I hear, ARCA, ADRA, and I explain to them that this problem is very serious for these kids. And all of them say, unfortunately, we don't have any specialists. And unfortunately, we don't have any problems, like programs which we can, yes, use for these kids. We have money, but we can't use for these kids because it's no, nobody mentioned it before when we planned these programs, and it's for two years. So only expert forum agreed to help these kids. They bought some necessary equipment, and I work with these kids at my own house for free as a volunteer because nobody else wants to do it. And these kids are the same kids as all other kids. They are very intelligent, very smart, and they also want to have normal life. But unfortunately, nobody cares about them. So I hope maybe something will be changed soon after this meeting. Thanks a lot for your support. Iulia este ea însă și terapist și a făcut un mic grup de copii, în general de vârstă preșcolară cu tulburări de spectru autist și aici a mers o parte din ajutorul pe care l-am primit din, pentru că e important să fie susținute grupurile astea de nișă pentru care nu avem soluții pe sisteme publice, asta este ideea. Societatea civilă se mai mobilizează, dar la un moment dat trebuie să vină statul să preia aceste sarcini, ca și toate celelalte probleme arată disfuncțiile statului, care n-au apărut acum din cauza războiului din Ucraina. Ele existau din totdeauna. Ilia Gubernicov, please, uh, add to this list of problems with what you have from your experience. Hello, everybody. My name is Ilia Gubernicov. And if Ukrainian people have problems, they usually speak to me. Uh, the problem that the speaker before me mentioned here is that we have a lot of things that exist in Romania, but they just don't work. For example, she mentioned two things, disability and allocatia de stat pentru copii. <coughs> Pardon. And allocatia de stat pentru copii, if any government representatives here, says that all children without discrimination 
legally living in Romania should be able to receive it. And they actually started giving it out for a couple of months. And then they just wrote a circular that, uh, you know, the temporary protection does not exactly mention whatever decision which we appealed by saying that when you answer, you must give the decision with the <coughs> legal text. You cannot give your answer based on a circular of your boss just saying that I don't think they deserve it or they should have it. And do you know what they answer to the decision? Like, uh, we don't know temporary protection, we don't know, uh, uh, uh. exactly the same. We are going to court with this, and because this is the only option to fix things that don't work. Government did not work. They started making payments now after a delay of eight months. Eight months of people with children, with uh, children with autism, with people who are unable to work. 65-year-old plus people who were supposedly taken care of. Like, yes, on paper it looks very nice. But for eight months it did not work at all. And we were like this close. I was talking to the lawyers. Yes, I talked to lawyers, unfortunately, too much to sue in the government on this because the government is, was 100% at fault. Even if the court case would be settled, yes, we, we are solu our solution is now suing everybody, I think. Salute. <laughs> hey. uh, so look, uh, there are a lot of things in Romania that uh, exist, but they just don't work. A lot. The two things that are now suffering the most is the social sphere and the uh, justice system. Ukrainians having tremendous hard time navigating the justice system because uh, I can see it in the last months, in the last months, about 300 families turned to me uh, with the problem that they were cheated out of money by somebody else, yes, by people in, uh, in the country, and uh, they needed help because when they come to police, they're like, well, uh, bring your own translator, please. Um, though there is an Article 81G of Penal Code that says that a victim must be provided a translator. Like, it is nonsensical to any lawyer in this country that the police would say, bring your own translator with you. So those are the, for me, what I see. Now, two most difficult spheres, the social sphere and the justice system. And people having hard time living when they don't feel protected by the justice system and they don't feel that they're supported by the social system. And the government circular that we talked about, it rolled back a lot of assistance that were already existed because everybody closed everything. Because, well, maybe temporary protection really doesn't do it. So again, until we go to court with this, it will be closed. I don't want to make like a long uh, conversation about it, but the two system, I, I tell you again, is justice system, navigation, because uh, a lot of people consider Ukrainian people unable to navigate the procedures in the justice system and the language barrier, which I try to help them to navigate by creating templates that they can fill out without uh, big knowledge and pre giving them exactly process how to apply. Like if you want to file a complaint, how do you do it? And the police would not say no. You can just mail it with a confirmation of receipt. Then you have a timestamp, they must register it anyways. If anybody wants from the civil society to help with budget for lawsuits, hit me up. Thank you. <laughs> yes, really. Because people were starved out of any money and assistance. How they can protect themselves, even in court, when they basically don't have any means to feed uh, themselves? How do they going to protect themselves?
Ok, I think this is my time. Thank you. Doar să pun o... Uh, so just to, to put a final dot on both interventions. What we see now, the community of Ukrainians, they are a mirror which is put in front of the Romanian state institutions and you are experiencing now the problems that we experience, just that for us it's a little bit easier to solve them because we know the language and you push and pull, but join the club. This is a Romanian state. So probably together with you, because you are so energetic, especially you, Ilya, maybe we can solve the problem together, you know, through advocacy, through pressing the institutions. This is what we need to do. The problems did not appear now with you. This is what we were fighting, we have been fighting for 30 years to reform. So, <laughs> I don't know, this is Eastern Europe, so. Uh, but it's very tragic what is happening and uh, it would be good to have had a functional state in which you could come. But sadly, you know, surprise, surprise, this is not Denmark. Uh, so we need to fix it together. That's, that's a message. Yeah? yeah, we do, because we are Romanians, so <laughs> probably you see the bright parts as well, I mean, from <laughs> but uh, yeah, I wanted to make this point that uh, these are pre-existing problems, which we never solved before, so probably now, with you and with a big push. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have invited some uh, governmental representatives of uh, official official uh, administration in Romania. We have invited also the Ministry of Family, but she, they didn't come. So, um, so uh, let's let us. Uh, Haideți să ascultăm acum câte ceva și din experiența organizațiilor care românești care uh, au acționat încă de la început pentru integrarea refugiaților ucraineni. Din, din informațiile mele, Sorin, mă contrazici dacă mă înșel, în momentul de față, din milioanele de uh, ucraineni care au traversat frontiera, uh, s-au stabilit sau sunt acum și lucrează pe, și trăiesc pe teritoriul României 80.000 de ucraineni. Deci e vorba totuși de o cifră importantă. Andreea Vrânceanu e aici. Da, Andreea, ne pot spune uh, câte ceva despre experiența organizației Katia? Da, e da, da, e mai bine, fiindcă avem și filmare, da? Bună seara tuturor! Uh, M-am tot gândit pe măsură... Romanian or English? Who prefers... Cine preferă română? Mâna Romanian. sus! <laughs> Rămână? Okay, I am uh, sure that you'll get the right translation. So, hearing out, uh, ascultând ceea ce antevorbitorii mei menționau, mă gândeam ce aș vrea să punctez. Pentru că n-aș vrea să vă răpesc foarte mult din timp. Uh, domnul Ionita a punctat foarte, foarte bine uh, partea cu bine ați venit în România și că acestea sunt probleme cu care ne conf confruntăm și noi românii. Și da, sistemul nu este perfect și mai avem mult de lucrat până să ajungem la nivelul iată. Da, ne marci. Um, la Brașov, cred că putem să spunem că totuși statul român a livrat. A reușit să facă ceva, pentru că răspunsul la criza pentru Ucraina în Brașov a fost inițiat de viceprimarul Brașovului, de primăria municipiului Brașov și continuat împreună cu societatea civilă. Deci, iar, iată că se poate. Administrația locală, ca inițiator, care a avut curajul să treacă peste ceea ce spuneau membrii guvernului la momentul la care s-a iscat criza, că nu ar trebui să facem nimic. Ar trebui să așteptăm vești de la guvern despre ce ar trebui să facem. Iar administrația locală a spus că mai înainte de toate avem o datorie ca oameni să facem ceva într-o astfel de criză. S-a întâmplat această masă rotundă în care reprezentanții ONG-urilor și societății civile s-au adunat și au întocmit un plan astfel încât pe 4 martie 2022 se deschidea primul centru pentru primire refugiați din Brașov. Și dacă nu mă înșel, cred că printre primele din, din România. Un centru integrat, 
care oferea servicii 360 de grade, de la partea de cazare, masă, ajutor medical de urgență, până la partea de informare și de ajutor în navigare în acest hățiș administrativ cu care ne confruntăm fiecare dintre noi. Și vreau să punctez un singur lucru aici. Vorbim din ce în ce mai mult despre integrare. Și cred că în tot acest proces este foarte important să vorbim și despre setarea și alinierea așteptărilor și să ne întrebăm vecinii, concetățenii, prietenii ucrainieni, ce își doresc și cum putem să îi sprijinim pe cei de aici sau pe cei din Ucraina și că poate discursul, conversațiile ar trebui să se ducă mai degrabă spre incluziune decât spre integrare. Vă mulțumesc frumos! Mulțumesc foarte mult! Aș vrea, deci, după cum vedeți, sunt și nevoi foarte mari de informare. Cred că Guvernul României, primul ministru, Ministerul de Linie, adică Ministerul Familiei, Ministerul Muncii, în primul rând, Ministerul Educației ar trebui să creeze uh, celule de informare cu, uh, uh, trans, cu traducere în limba ucraineană. Nu e atât de greu de găsit. Uh, Facultatea de limbi străine vă stă la dispoziție cu Catedra de Ucraineană, da? unde puteți găsi suport, dacă e nevoie de chiar voluntariat, uh, pentru a uh, redacta și a publica broșuri și uh, site-uri internet uh, pe limba ucraineană în care să, toate măsurile guvernamentale să fie bine explicate. Aș da acum cuvântul lui Luca Ciobotaru, care a venit din partea Asociației Rădăuțiul Civic, care este una din asociațiile care s-a implicat foarte mult, mergând chiar pe teritoriul ucrainei, în Herson, și cred că are niște lucruri de spus. Luca. Bună ziua, Bună ziua tuturor! Mă mulțumesc pentru invitație, în primul rând, mă sunt onorat să fiu aici, chiar dacă contextul care ne-a dus împreună nu este unul fericit. Asociația Rădăuțul Civic pe care o conduc e situată la 20 de km de Vama Siret și a fost printre primele organizații care au ajuns în Vama Siret când a început războiul în luna februarie. A urmat un an de zile de sprijin de urgență cu inclusiv voluntari, peste 100 de voluntari, ture de 24 de ore, erau cetățeni care sau, practic, făceau câte o noapte albă ca să ofere un astfel de sprijin, inclusiv un hub umanitar cu 250 de transporturi în Ucraina, din Ivano Frankivsk până spre Bahmut, Harkov sau chiar Sumi și alte, sau Sloviansk, în, în regiuni mai îndepărtate, unde am colaborat intens și cu organizația Expert Forum și multe alte organizații în România. Ultimul an s-a concentrat mult pe, efort, pe eforturile de integrare și de asigurare acestei incluziuni de care e atât de mare nevoie, Încercând să oferim, practic, complementar sau, practic, înlocuind efortul statului, cursuri de limbă română și engleză, care au fost foarte căutate și care sunt și astăzi în continuare în, în, în funcțiune. Există grupe de cetățeni ucraineni care vin zilnic la centrul comunitar din municipiul Rădăuț. Mediere comunitară, discuții cu directori de școli care spuneau că nu au locuri să înscrie elevii la școală, deși cetățenii erau în circumscripția școlii lor, inclusiv discuții, de exemplu, însoțirea cetățenilor la bancă ca translatori cu facilitatori comunitari pentru deschiderea unui cont bancar sau lucruri foarte simple despre găsirea unui medic de familie. Și cred că, pentru că s-a discutat despre acest efort de integrare, e esențial ca acest efort să fie dus la nivel de politici publice în, în perioada următoare, să există poate puncte unice de contact la nivelul fiecărui județ, au existat niște încercări, poate chiar unele reușite din partea agențiilor ONU, de a crea grupuri de coordonare la nivel județean între instituții ale statului și societate civilă. Existau, de exemplu, direcții de asistență socială la nivelul UAT-urilor, la nivelul primărilor, care aveau practici diferite și cereau documente diferite, deși serviciul era același pentru uh, cetățenii respectivi. Uh, și am întâlnit inclusiv cazuri uh, în care, din păcate, Uh, pentru că acele plăți pentru programul, noul program 50-20, n-au fost făcute la timp, uh, cetățenii au renunțat să depună dosarele, deși erau eligibili. Deci, practic, a fost o resursă 
care a fost irosită sau poate n-a fost accesată la timp. Îmi doresc mult ca uh, acest efort și tot efortul societății civile uh, din, din România să continue. Cred că toți cei care am avut o formă de sprijin mai mică sau mai mare pentru uh, cetățenii ucraineni să continuăm să spunem aceste povești mai departe. Am observat poate și o schimbare de atitudine în societatea românească uh, cu uh, privire la uh, uh, iată, criza umanitară și cred că e foarte important să spunem aceste povești mai departe, să explicăm oamenilor care nu au avut, au citit despre uh, uh, criza umanitară doar din presă sau din, din social media, să spunem poveștile celor cu care lucrăm pentru ca uh, concetățenii noștri să înțeleagă cu adevărat ce înseamnă să, să treci printr-un război. Noi am întâmpinat în vama de la mașini cu caroseria găurită de, de gloanțe până la autocare cu copii din orfelinate care trebuiau relocate și degea SPC-ului nu erau pregătite să le preia. Așa că nu pot decât să sper că vom păstra această solidaritate și mai mult de atât poate prin canale de la nivel național să colectăm aceste semnale de la nivelul, de la firul ierbii, din, din, de la beneficiarii direct sau de la cei care lucrează direct cu cetățenii ucraineni pentru ca ele să poată fi rezolvate prin niște uh, măsuri de politică publică. Vă mulțumesc și uh, slava Ucrainei! Mulțumesc, Luca! Nu știu, Malva este aici, Asociația Malva? Nu știu. Uh, bun, am să-i dau cuvântul acum lui Radu Hosu, despre care v-am vorbit în introducerea mea, uh, care poate că ne va spune câte ceva despre ce a însemnat pentru el și pentru oamenii din jurul lui solidaritatea cu Ucraina și cu oamenii care luptă în Ucraina. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. I'm honored. I will speak in English because I probably there are more people that understand English than Romanian here. Uh, First of all, I would like to say that in contrast with, to uh, what Sorin is saying about the, uh, our centralized powers, uh, so uh, ad central administration, uh, back in Brasov, what Andrea uh, uh, did with Katia and our uh, local government uh, did was quite different. Uh, what she didn't say is that now in Katia uh, we have integration points. I know this because I been there volunteer for a few weeks uh, during uh, doing uh, the night shift uh, so uh, we have a point of uh, integration by uh, we have uh, services for kids uh, to learn Romanian uh, and this started way before any anybody else in Romania try, try to do this in a uh, organized way with the help of any form of authority, uh, be it local or, or central. Uh, what I want to say by this, stating this contrast is that where there's a will, there's a way. So if there is a political will, you can do it. The problem in Romania is, most of the time, is not that we don't have the framework to do it, but we don't have the political will. And why? Because, let's be frank, Ukrainians don't bring votes. If they would, trust me, you will have all the... Uh, you, you will have a highway through the uh, 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 ju judicial uh, system. Everything would be uh, fixed if you would bring votes. So basically, it, it, it takes guts from, for the political uh, uh, people in the government or in the local governments to do uh, something for, for, for the, the Ukrainian refugees. And, you know, guts is quite rare anywhere, not only in Romania, but anywhere in the world. Uh, regarding uh, solidarity, so the idea is, just to close up, if we push our, uh, our uh, government, our political parties, our politicians, and we say that for us, in order to vote for them, the Ukrainian agenda, the Ukrainian uh, 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 problem, not the problem, uh, support, the Ukrainian support, it is a very important uh, piece of our political agenda, then we might make them, okay, so you, you will go to vote, you are interested in uh, Ukrainian support, I will have to give you something, because we are in an election year, right? So I will have to give you something in order to get your vote. 
So what do you want with the uh, Ukrainian support? Judicial uh, system help. Okay. If I will get to be a deputy, I will do that. Or if I will be a senator, I will do that. But that's important because then we put it on the uh, public agenda. From public agenda, we can transform it into public policy. But that's up to everybody, uh, abs all of us from, uh, from this room. Not only uh, social society or, uh, or Ukrainian embassy or Rom Romanian or Ukrainian diplomats. Everybody uh, around here has to uh, use his voice. Uh, regarding solidarity and my, my experience, I started uh, my support for Ukraine in 26th of February 2022, so almost two years ago, writing night summaries, uh, meaning what's happening on the front lines. I was writing them every night, because on the day I was uh, working as a political consultant, in the night what I was uh, writing this, it, they became um, uh, viral. And after that, uh, in the summer, uh, your Romanian Ukrainian uh, soldier from you know, who was fighting in Donbas contacted me. No, he didn't die. Not, not that one. Uh, Misha uh, contacted me and said he needed help uh, to get humanitarian aid to the people liberated in the, in the uh, countryside in, in Donbas. So we were thinking about if, if I get to gather about, uh, to raise about 10,000 euros, it would be absolutely amazing. I just made a partial total uh, last week. I, I raised about 750,000 euros already and send them to Ukraine. I've been to Ukraine lots of times. I spent a few months on the front lines in Kharkiv region, in Kherson region. I've been to Bakhmut three times. Basically, at almost any city that you know and you heard about in Ukraine, except of Avzivka, because I've been, I was in Romania, uh, I've been there. Bakhmut, Slovyansk, Kramatorsk, Kharkiv, uh, Kherson, Odessa, Nikolaev, uh, I don't know, Krivoy Rog, uh, Dnieper, uh, Pavlograd, Petrograd, all around, uh, giving as much as I could from Romanians. Uh, so 750,000 euros from approximately 15,000 uh, uh, Romanians on my Facebook page. That's quite a lot because I have a pool of 72,000 followers. So from 72,000 followers, about 15,000 of them donated to me at least once. And they trusted me to use those money, that, those sums of money exactly for what I'm trying to, to do. What I've done, uh, what I brought there, if uh, you're interested, uh, four um, military trucks, five ambulances, uh, one fire truck that I brought to Bakhmut. I was uh, a neighbor with Prigozhin for a few hours. Um, I, uh, with the help of Romanians, because 99.99 percent of the donations are from them, uh, I funded a medical hospital, a mobile medical hospital, one thousand, one hundred and fifty thousand euros. Uh, he, uh, gen uh, gas, uh, uh, gasoline generators for the winter in 2022-2023 uh, winter because you, if you remember uh, Ukraine was heavily shelled and the electrical system was, uh, the, the power grid was down many times so they needed uh, uh, generators. I brought 30 generators over there. The idea is that Romanians do help and they are really interested. Uh, it is very, very important how, how you speak with them and how do you translate the problems that they are in Ukraine in a way that they can understand and they can relate. A lot of times we speak down on Romanians because we, yeah, of course, we have a lot of, uh, we have extremism in the, on the rise because it's funded by Russia, because they want to st destabilize Romania. We get that. But the problem is like this. 
our government didn't have any campaign, public communication campaign to understand, for the masses to understand, the people to understand what's happening in Ukraine. If you remember, uh, at the end of the uh, full scale, uh, scale invasion, we had two guys from Botoshan or from Yash, that they went with the, with the car to Kiev to understand. They didn't believe it's from Yash? Okay. So they didn't believe that there is a war, I, I think two months after the war started. Yeah, I don't think there is a war. Why? Because if there, is, there, isn't, there isn't a campaign, an official campaign by the government authorities to say, look, it is a war, it's like this, it's like this, we need to help. Why? Because of this, because of this. How can you help? Like this, like this, like this. There, there was no such thing. There were only, ah, oh, we the government, we are helping. We are paying money to help Ukrainians. No, you did. You are not. I hope somebody from the government is here. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Please listen to me. You didn't. Those money were from the European Union. You never said that publicly. You only said, we are helping Ukrainians. No, European Union helped Ukrainians. And I know that you can use that, but we are a contributor to Euro European Union. Yes, but we, the Romanians, are net... Um, Beneficiary, beneficiaries. So, mai ușor cu pianul pe scări în română, se zice. Așa. No, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to uh, censor myself because this is something that it's for real about life and death situations. There are people that are dying in Romania because of lack of, uh, of support and by no fault of, fault of their own. And in Ukraine, the same. But I'm not saying about in Ukraine, because in Ukraine, I know that the Romanian government is helping as much as they can. Again, there is no public communication. I don't know why. But in Romania, there are lots of problems. Uh, delays in payments, as you said before. You can, it is not acceptable, from my perspective. Eight months delay in payments for people that don't understand the language, that they, left, they fled a country from war, so they fled from bombs to come here and do what? They have dignity. So with this, with this delay, we hit in, the, in their dignity because they have to go to... No, they understand English. They understand. The, the, the government understands English. I hope so. If they don't, then... So... They, we hit, we the government hit the dignity of Ukrainians if we delay for eight months because they have to go and say, please, to go on the street or somewhere and say, please help me with money. Now imagine how that person feels after they fled a war, coming into a European Union country, a developed economy, wow, and they have to go and beg for money because eight months. They don't get the money they're supposed to. So I wouldn't blame the, popu the Romanian population. We are in a democracy. We have the right to believe in whatever we believe. It is those who are in power, in charge, and maybe civil society uh, duty to uh, inform the people. And after that, If they still believe stupid things coming from uh, Russian propaganda, well, we'll try to isolate them if we can. I'm not, for I myself, I'm not speaking with any uh, pro-Russian anymore. I'm just blocking them on Facebook. And if it's face-to-face, uh, -face, man, you believe Putin? Yep, F off. F off. We don't have anything in common with, let's not talk. So yeah, uh, let's act together. I mean, this is, I hope this is not a, this is, we didn't gather around here just to talk, but to do something. Uh, I'm begging you to continue to support Ukraine because this is very important. Again, this is not about who's better, who's worse, who's thinking this, who's believing that. It's about helping a life, lives, many lives. So yeah, I think this is the most important thing we could do in, in our lifetime, helping others. Thank you.
Radu este nu numai un luptător pentru Ucraina și pentru un intermediar extraordinar, dar este și un, o sursă extraordinară de știri. Eu urmăresc pagina lui de Facebook în care face informări săptămânale, se numește jurnalul de noapte, uneori mai des când e nevoie, informări care iau în considerare surse mult mai vaste, mai importante, mai directe decât informările pe care le avem prin canalele oficiale. Știm cu toții că România este foarte prudentă în, atât în mesajele publice cât și în buletinele de știri. Oficialii români sunt extrem... Asta a fost o, o constatare. Oficialii români sunt extrem de rezervați în a face comentarii. Uh, uneori chiar uh, vorbesc o limbă de lemn, foarte des. Uh, la Radu găsiți o informare corectă care vine din surse sigure și găsiți, mai găsiți ceva, găsiți un optimism extraordinar de care sunt convins că foarte multe lume are nevoie. Sorin? Just to add two more words, because Radu said that uh, we have this problem that you guys don't vote and this is why they don't listen to you. However, as you probably know, we have a member of the parliament in the lower chamber who represents the Ukrainian community in Romania, the historical, uh, and he's got, his name is Miroslav Petretsky. I don't know if you know him. I don't. Uh, but and uh, when you spoke, I just, uh, I just, it came to me that I got an invitation from him. Next week on the 27th, he organizes an event in the parliament, seven days of war, da, 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 da. He says he will invite the Ukrainian community. So I suggest we structure your problems and you go there with it. We put you on the list. I will pass you the invitation. So let's use this guy to press from inside the institutions your case and your problems, not just us from the outside. Because I mean, this is why we pay him, and the salaries are quite quite good in the Romanian Parliament. So let's put the guys to do some useful work. So that would be my proposal. We'll discuss about this invitation. So it's 27th, 12 o'clock in the Parliament. So why not? Uh, I mean, let's transform uh, this uh, celebrate. It's not a celebration because it's war, but let's do something useful as well with this uh, with this time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sorin. Thank you. It's very useful. So, uh, haideți să deschidem puțin discuția pentru comentarii, uh, persoane care ar vrea să spună lucruri, întrebări, întrebări. Da, ministerele sunt aici, câteva ministere. Noi am invitat uh, reprezentanța ai primului ministru, uh, al, ai ministrului de externe, avem pe domnul uh, Dan Coman, uh, ai ministerului Muncii, nu? Avem aici. Uh, S-au ridicat câteva probleme practice, sigur, de informare, o celulă de criză, uh, contacte la administrația locală, uh, asistență socială, uh, educație, uh, chestiunea DGASPC-urilor și a ajutoarelor uh, pentru copii, medicina de familie. Sunt o serie întreagă de probleme care au fost totuși ridicate. Poate că aveți unele răspunsuri, da? De la Ministerul Muncii... Sigur, veniți lângă mine. Bună seara tuturor! Mă numesc Francis Oscar Gal, subsecretar de stat la Ministerul Muncii. Îmi pare rău că nu vorbesc limba engleză, am 56 de ani, împlinesc imediat, și îmi pare rău, pe vremea mea se învăța foarte multă limba rusă. Deci îmi pare rău că nu vorbesc engleză, Uh, a, nu mi-aduc chiar așa de bine aminte ca să pot, uh, și nici nu vreau să vorbesc din Baru, să vă spun sincer. Am fost într-o vacanță nu de mult și era o stațiune plină de, de ruși și chiar uh, nu m-am simțit bine deloc. Uh, am înțeles că s-au ridicat uh, niște probleme care sunt, uh, sunt extrem de vitale pentru uh, cei veniți din uh, Ucraina, România și nu au venit de bine, au venit de rău. Dar haideți să o luăm așa puțin cu, că, cu începutul. Începutul războiului mai prins chiar la câteva zile de la numirea Ministerul Muncii. Eu provin din partea grupului, grupului parlamentar al minorităților naționale. Este pentru prima oară că grupul parlamentar intră la guvernare cu câteva posturi de subsecretar de stat. 
S-a pomenit și numărul, numele domnului Miroslav Petreții, pe, pe care îl cunosc personal, face parte din grupul minorităților naționale și vă asigur că alături de foarte multe organizații ale minorităților naționale, la primele zile de la începerea războiului, de la invadarea uh, nebleznică a Rusiei, a, au participat foarte activ, mai ales în zonele de frontieră. Am participat și eu acolo câteva zile, recunosc nu m-am implicat uh, direct pentru că din natura poziției mele nu am putut, nu că nu am vrut, dar tot sprijinul meu a fost acordat tuturor organizațiilor. De-a lungul timpului uh, am, am participat la multe activități de ajutor. Am fost și în Ucraina de două ori, am fost personal cu medicamente. Nu mă laud, nu e revolvă laudă, e doar o constatare pentru că minoritatea pe care o reprezintă este vorba de minoritatea ruteană, pentru că în Ucraina sunt foarte mulți ruteni și rutenii din Ucraina merită să fie ajutați ca și tot, toate celelalte, celelalte, toți celelalte cetățeni. Revenind la partea cu Ministerul Muncii, nu pot să vă asigur decât că am, am înțeles cu durere ceea ce se întâmplă. Una e să vezi la televizor durerea și alta o să o înțelege aici, povestită de, de dumneavoastră. O să las datele de contact pentru a face posibilă câteva întâlniri și vă că Ministerul Muncii nu este, n-ar fi singur în această ecuație. Ar fi vorba de Ministerul Educației, de Ministerul Familiei, Ministerul Sănătății, Ministerul de Interne, prin poate din direcțiile sale din subordine și n-ar fi rău pentru că societatea civilă, ong care lucrează în acest domeniu, ar putea să inițieze, să promoveze o întâlnire la un nivel, să zic, și poate de secretar de stat, în care să punem pe masă absolut toate problemele care rezidă din aceste chestiuni și să le găsim soluții. Sunt grele, recunosc, nu sunt ușor de rezolvat, pentru că toate problemele ridicate aici se cuantifică. Vrând, nevrând, cu durere mare, nu putem să spunem decât durerea se cuantifică. Și aici sunt vorba de sume și nu sunt vorba de sume uh, mici, sunt vorba de sume mari. Dar eu sunt convins că prin dialog, prin discuții, prin atragerea uh, a, a atenției asupra acestor chestiuni a factorilor de decizie, nu pot fi decât un câștig pentru dumneavoastră. Vă asigur de, de uh, toată deschiderea mea, las datele de contact aici pentru o întâlnire următoare și care poate, poate va avea, uh, vor avea să, sorți de izbândă. Numai încercând putem să, să vedem cum se deulează mai departe această chestiune. Vă mulțumesc! Mulțumesc pentru deschidere și eu, e foarte bună ideea. Problem... Mica problemă este că noi am organizat două întâlniri la biroul primului ministru, una pe educație, una pe probleme sociale, și primul ministru a invitat ministerele de resort și s-a plâns la noi după aia primul ministru că ministerele nu îi răspund și nu vin la întâlnire. Super, dar se pare că hârtia pe care au trimis el, deci biroul primul, cancelarea primului ministru, nu e suficient de puternică să aducă Ministerul Muncii la o negociere pe aceste chestii. Și atunci o să încercăm noi să aducem cumva, să facem ceva, să poată și primul ministru să intre în contract cu ministerele. Mulțumesc, domnule secretar de stat. De la Ministerul de Externe, domnul Coman, poate vreți să ne dați un mesaj? Bună seara, numele meu este Dan Iancu și vreau să... Iancu, în primul rând vreau să transmit salutul doamnei ministru Lumința Odobescu, care a primit invitația, dar nu a putut să o onoreze pentru că este într-o vizită externă. I will continue in English to say that personally I am disheartened but by the problems that I uh, witness and I listen to uh, this evening. Uh, but professionally, I'm afraid that uh, I cannot bring a meaningful contribution to the discussion this, this evening. And um, I was wondering whether my, uh, my intervention would... Sorry, sorry. Could I interrupt? Yeah. Are you with? What organization? MFA. Ah. Foreign Affairs. Okay. So... Um, And I was thinking whether uh, what I could say from what uh, the uh, MFA is doing uh, is actually fitting with the substance of, of the discussion. So I'll, I will limit myself to uh, three, four points. 
Uh, I will pick up from where the ambassador Prokop Juk has, has left off uh, of um, the, the comprehensive uh, presentation of the suffering of the uh, crimes uh, in Ukraine, but also of resistance, because what, what started as, as what's said by the propaganda in Kremlin, the three-day special operation, we are two years on, Ukraine is resisting, and as Ambassador mentioned, one, um, um, it's, Ukraine is also achieving success in some respects. Uh, for example, in pushing the uh, Russian fleet out of the, the western uh, part of the Black Sea, uh, so, uh, and, and well, inflicting heavy losses to, to the uh, Russian um, fleet. Um, Second, to say that um, after two years, uh, well, the, the commemoration is, is always a time of, of remembering uh, the, the destruction and the, 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 the victims, but um, it, it's nonetheless, I think, important to remember that war is happening at, uh, right next to, to us. It might be difficult to believe this uh, while you, we are all living uh, normal lives um, here in, in Eucharist. And I was thinking uh, this on the way here uh, at the beginning of this beautiful spring in Eucharist that it's important to keep uh, the, um, the war in Ukraine, the uh, Russian aggression high on our agenda, and also the, uh, the, the problems of, uh, that we, we uh, have also uh, listened this evening of uh, uh, yeah, the refugees in, in Romania, um, uh, which is well one important chapter of of, of this uh, this crisis. Um, second or third, to to recall that um, uh, beyond this uh, this this uh, this security uh, crisis and the, the, th the threat that Russia represents to uh, us, um, Ukraine has achieved also uh, a lot in other respects. For example, is now on a clear path to EU membership, and we hope to a uh, irreversible, irreversible path to NATO membership, that Ukraine has managed to, to implement deep and comprehensive reforms, which were uh, recognized as such by, by the um, European Union and um, well going along with this and moving to um, to the political relations between Romania and Ukraine I would say that uh, last year was probably the richest uh, that we ever had in since Ukraine's independence and I will uh, point only to a couple of things and I'm sure that ambassador could also uh, witness uh, and uh, bring also testimony in, in this in this respect first uh, I will not start with that but is the probably the most important but I will start with what is in my job description uh, well politically I think we we are working now on establishing a, a strategic partnership well, this might be words, but it's it's in our line of work. This is the highest you can get. Can, in can, can you give some details of, about this strategic partnership? It's it's about uh, structuring what uh, we plan to do, not only now but also in future, on all lines of work from uh, well, supporting the multilateral formats to agriculture. So it's 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 a lot. Um, and we are working together to put this on, on uh, and to structure this in, in um, uh, on, on uh, in a uh, bilateral document. Uh, second, that we last year we had a lot of firsts, and uh, we had the first ever joint meeting of our governments. Um, Romania has this uh, practice with a number of countries. But I know that Ukraine had only one uh, this uh, exercise before with Poland, so it is also important. Um, 
and then we we had our I mean uh, something that the MFA uh, did we had our um, first uh, training course for uh, uh, Ukrainian public servants in the central administration uh, a course on uh, European affairs and we Romania was the first EU member states which did that on the territory of Ukraine so this was in, in September last year but I think what is most important uh, and the discussion until now this, this evening proved that is that the, the most lasting gain that we, we saw uh, so far uh, is uh, the solidarity and the bonds that were created by this tragedy between Romanians and Ukrainians. Uh, I think we can all, if we look back uh, 10 years ago, I don't think that many Romanians uh, could have uh, put forward names, important names for Ukrainian culture or sports or politics and vice versa also for, for, uh, for Ukrainians. Um, not to say, not to mention also the, the number of cliches that were accumulated because of the lack of communication. Language barrier is, is probably one, one explanation but there are probably others as well. Those two years of, of war of sufferings had this collateral effect of, of bringing well, the societies, the people together, realizing that what they thought before is not, is not uh, holding water and that there is, we are very much uh, alike. Uh, and Mr. Yonitsa mentioned one feature of that, how alike we are in I'm not, I'm not repeated, but so you, you will uh, remember. Um, and, uh, well, my last point is uh, Ambassador Prokopchuk, uh, well, in his presentation mentioned, well, all s the, the whole uh, picture of Ukraine's needs, uh, of challenges, of uh, lines of support. We, I, just to uh, would like just to mention that Romania is part of all of those lines of effort that are designed uh, at the European level or regionally uh, bilaterally as well to uh, to um, to help Ukraine. If it's about accountability, I mean um, um, seeking justice, we are we are there. Uh, if it's about uh, uh, pushing forward uh, EU's support for Ukraine in terms of, let's say, uh, there is this uh, European peace facility which finances uh, military and security support for Ukraine, we are, we are uh, pushing for, uh, for that as well. Sanctions regime against, um, against Russia, uh, just a couple of days ago the 13th package was, was adopted. Uh, the probably others will, will, will follow. So in, in all, all these strands of effort, which are not in the headlines because they are either too technical or too uh, remote from, from, uh, from public uh, concern, for public interest, uh, or for from the tragedy of that uh, uh, the TVs and the, the, uh, and the the social media is bringing it to, to us. Uh, the um, well, Romania is, is trying to do its its best. Um, I, I will stop here because it, I feel that is not exactly the gist of this discussion. That uh, uh, my con well, my intervention is uh, was trying to to make. Thank you. Much nice mood. Uh, aș vrea să dau cuvântul și unor uh, membri GRS reprezentativi pentru uh, organizația noastră, persoane care au reflectat asupra, uh, asupra crizei ucrainene, asupra situației de criză, de fapt europene, în care acest război uh, ne-a pus. Domnul Andrei Oișteanu.
Bună seara! Sunt Andrei Oisteanu, membru al Grupului pentru Dialog Social și asociat cu Institutul de Istoria Religiilor al Academiei Române. În urmă cu doi ani, după invazia brutală și neprovocată a Ucrainei, am scris un text a cărui concluzie era că Rusia va pierde acest război chiar dacă îl va câștiga și Ucraina va câștiga acest război chiar dacă îl va pierde. E un mic joc de cuvinte, un paradox care se dovedește a fi adevărat pentru că pe de o parte toată lumea a simțit, toată lumea liberă a simțit că se naște sindromul cetății asediate și s-au solidarizat împotriva agresorului și împotriva dorinței domnului Putin s-a creat un mit fondator al Ucrainei moderne și contemporane și se ridică uh, și a regăsit identitatea culturală, etnică și lingvistică pe care Putin o neagă. Această negare a identității ucrainene a condus și diverse interese geopolitice, a dus la solidarizarea de cealaltă parte a, a prietenilor, a filor, a putinofililor, care se află peste tot în lume, se află și în Europa, ba chiar în Uniunea Europeană și chiar în Parlamentul European. Și chiar în Parlamentul Român. Și aș vrea să vă întreb, domnule ambasador, am văzut că aveți un interpret. Sunt două partide în Parlamentul European care susțin această lipsă de identitate și susțin ideea regimului Putin ca Polonia, România, Slovacia să atace Ucraina cu că e momentul potrivit și să preia unele teritorii disputate. Și aș vrea să vă întreb care este statutul domnului Simion și a doamnei Șoșoacă față de statul Ucraina. Și de asemenea vreau să vă întreb care este situația cu divorțul uh, creștinătății ucrainene între ortodoxia vasală creștinătății rusești și patriarhului Kiril și respectiv creștinătatea ucraineană autodeclarată autocefală. Um, I hope I understood the, the questions correctly uh, with the translation. Um, regarding the first one, the first question, uh, these uh, claims that we uh, occasionally hear from certain political forces in, in uh, different countries. Um, I mentioned in my uh, introductory remarks that um, Uh, the 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 uh, false interpretations of uh, historical past that uh, we observe from Moscow uh, is leading now to this has led to this uh, 
awful tragedy of uh, the war that Russia unleashed against Ukraine. And uh, alongside some geopolitical ambitions of expansionism that uh, Moscow has, they also place some of these historic interpretations in the baseline of, uh, of the uh, invasion. Uh, you would recall that it was in, uh, in summer of 21, just uh, I think like six months before the full-scale invasion that uh, Vladimir Putin produced his uh, uh, historic essay arguing for non-existence of Ukraine and uh, the Ukrainian nation. And that was uh, widely interpreted as a very dangerous sign uh, regarding the intentions of Moscow. For us, for me personally, it is absolutely clear that the question of uh, borders in Europe has been settled. And this is what brought peace, stability, and prosperity to all European nations, regardless of the history they had in the 20th or 19th century. The borders have been established. Now this uh, new community has been formed as the European Union, where the people can basically travel across the continent without crossing any borders. But in effect, we know that they exist. And therefore, the, some claims that uh, I heard recently, and that was coming, the most recent one was uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, a now representative, uh, I think uh, his name is Claudio Terzio, again, uh, who, who made uh, some, some claims of territorial nature affecting Ukraine. Uh, we responded as an embassy, uh, denouncing uh, these claims and uh, any, any st steps or, or pronouncements that would uh, uh, be contrary to this uh, spirit of uh, friendship and good neighborliness and cooperation that we uh, enjoy between the two countries. And this is the line that we will continue to take uh, despite such, uh, such uh, uh, statements or positions uh, expressed by, by few politicians, individuals uh, in this country. Uh, we, we are also aware of the position that is taken by uh, the political leadership, by the parliament, in particular uh, through resolutions on support of uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of uh, uh, Ukraine and support for uh, internationally recognized borders. Uh, on the question of um, relationship between Uh, I do not have this uh, this information, so I will need to, to, to follow up with the authorities in Kiev to see what the status uh, for uh, Mr. Simeon is. Uh, so I will need to, to follow up on it. Um, regarding regarding the uh, relationship between between the churches. Um, Well, basically, as, as, you, as, you, as you know, it was in, the, in 2019 that uh, the Autocephalus Church of Ukraine was established. And this, uh, this status was received from the Ecumenical Patriarchate uh, uh, Bartholomew. Uh, the majority of uh, Orthodox believers in Ukraine now, they uh, belong to this church. Uh, that we have seen uh, a 
uh, some shifts that were taking place in this uh, in uh, in this landscape of the religious community as uh, different uh, communities were moving from the church of the Moscow Patriarchate to the uh, to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. There is a um, uh, draft legislation under consideration in the Parliament of Ukraine in the Verkhovna Rada that would uh, affect the functioning of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church under Moscow Patriarchate because it remains under the supervision of the uh, Patriarch in Moscow. Um, there is uh, lots of evidence to the effect that uh, the church in Moscow is complicit in the war of aggression that is conducted by Putin's regime against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people and therefore by implication that is of course the consequence for this church that remains under the governance of uh, Moscow's uh, patriarch. Until now, the, uh, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine has been uh, recognized by a number of other uh, Orthodox churches, the Greek Church, Cyprus, uh, Alexandria, and uh, for us, it is important that there is th some progress in, uh, on, on the part of uh, the Orthodox Church of Romania in terms of recognition and uh, establishment of ecumenical communication between the two churches. Um, in the circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in now, uh, this would be a very, very, very important step for, again, forging closer bonds between the, the, the people and the, the two nations. Thank you very much. Doamna Rodica Kucher, member of the Okay, for the benefit of our foreign guests, I will speak English. Um, so, the message gets through more clearly. Um, my name is Rodika Kulcher. I'm a member of the Group for Social Dialogue and a journalist with the 22 magazine. And I think that from the very beginning, um, we have to think about the responsibility that we as Romanians have in this context and it is quite appalling to find out what the uh, Ukrainian refugees have to go through uh, in our country. But to pick up on what uh, Radu Hoso was saying, there's, a, there's an elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room, to quote um, a famous personality that I will not name, um, is uh, the power of the Putin propaganda in Romania. And we have to be aware of it and not deny it and pretend it, it, it doesn't happen, that it is not here. We're not pretend, we're not, we're not underlying it forcefully enough. Because, yes, Radu said quite correctly, Ukrainians don't vote in Romanian elections, but that is not the problem, according to me. The problem is that people who are influenced by the Putin propaganda vote. And the fact that they do vote makes the political parties, especially those in power, be very cautious not to tread on their toes. And that's why you don't have any public pressures, and that's why you don't have... Well, maybe people in the government might want to be more helpful towards the com Ukrainian communities, but you don't want to upset the apple cart, which has been put into motion by people like Claudio Terzio, Giorgio Simeon, Diana Shoshwaka, etc. And that is taken over by TV stations, by a lot of people in the media, and in some parts of the civil society. Civil society is not just us. 
There are other people who are there and who don't <coughs> agree with us and we do not agree with them. So that's where maybe we should do a bit more, the media and the civil society that we are part of. Um, also, some intellectuals, I would have expected a bit more involvement, a bit more public pressure. If there's no public pressure, politicians won't move. Uh, people in America know that very well. There are no votes in Wales. There, when there was a, a world journalist who wanted to talk to an American presidential candidate, and there was a, there are no votes, the, no votes in Wales. I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, okay. Uh, then I do believe that we have somehow, because there was no involvement of people who were willing to um, engage with this problem and with the extremists, uh, we've lost the public. De we, we've lost the public debate. Uh, not that we've lost it, but we've. Uh, it's gone into a direction in which it should not have gone, and it's that of tribalism. We're discussing Ukrainian problem along ethnic lines and we should not because when the Ukrainians voted to break away from the Soviet Union in 1991 they did not do it along ethnic lines but for another type of civilization and for democracy we should discuss it politically and civilizationally that's w how we should put this and maybe then maybe then it would be understood that we are not standing up just, I mean, just don't take me wrong, you understand what I'm saying. It's not just for another country, just for the territory of other people who are not us. Yeah? Uh, we are standing up for a civilization and for a political system. And that's why Putin went to war. That's why he invaded Ukraine. And I think if we did that, and we could do, I mean, with the, the group for social dialogue, we can find a niche here in which we can insert ourselves and talk about it more forcefully. Then maybe there would be a bit of public pressure in an election year. Why not? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have also Armand Goshu here, which is a political analyst and expert in uh, Ukrainian and Moldavian Republic, uh, Republic of Moldavian problem. So, please. Nu am prea multe lucruri să vă spun. Ce era important, cred că s-a spus deja. Aș mai adăuga doar o categorie. Să ne amintim și să... Ar trebui să rămână undeva consemnat lucrul ăsta și mă bucur că am ocazia să o fac. În martie, la începutul lunii martie, un bun prieten, fostul corespondent F la București, care acum corespondent F la Kiev, m-a sunat în dimineața la 5 că nu putea, nu înțelegea, a venit ucrainieni la gara, era voluntar în gara de nord. Au venit și nu înțelegeau. Și m-a pus la telefon să traduc. Și mi-a spus, bă, la 5 dimineața eu știe că sunt puțin somnambul, și foarte matinal, și mi-a zis, uite, dacă poți, vin în gara de nord translator. Uh, era un șif dimineața de la 5 la 10, era neacoperit de translator, era un șif care nu era acoperit, prea era acoperit nici de voluntari, acolo erau voluntari din Statele Unite, erau mormoni, baptiști, alte organizații, problema cu ei, erau cei mai mulți, erau vreo șapte mormoni, vreo cinci baptiști, problema cu ei că nu, nu știau limba română. Și ca să te duci să cumperi bilete la caserițele din Gara de Nord, care sunt niște persoane foarte nervoase, am aflat și eu între timp. Uh, era probleme, nu vreau să, nici engleză, nici rusă, nici ucraineană, nimic, deci trebuia cineva care să fie translator. Uh, ei, și am fost vreo două luni traducători. Noi traducători aveam portocaliu pe noi și la un moment dat nici nu mai dădeam înapoi vesta, umblam pri, prin jurul gării sau pe sub, până la podul Grand cu vesta pe mine și mă opreau ucrainieni pe dar știau că cei cu portocaliu sunt translatori. Uh, și încercam să-i ajutăm cu ce puteam. Uh, am foarte multe amintiri de acolo, îmi pare rău că nu le-am notat, deși cineva a avut ideea, hai să scriem, să scoatem o carte, hai să ne amintim, hai să, măcar să înregistrăm lucrurile astea. 
Uh, pentru că aia a fost istorie. Deci eu sunt convins că, nu știu, copiii noștri, nepoții noștri vor învăța despre ce s-a întâmplat în acele luni, cum noi studiem la istorie despre ce s-a întâmplat în septembrie, octombrie cu refugiații polonezi, cu guvernul polonez 39, care au ajuns pe teritoriul României. Aia e istorie. Fericire. Sunt documente oficiale care să... Mulțumim pentru prezență Nataliei, David și Fămișin de la Ambasada Poloniei, care și a prezent aici, și care nu ne permit astăzi să scriem istorie. Cred că ne-a fi fost de mare ajutor să notăm acele experiențe. Am în gara de nord pot să vă spun că n-am văzut nici Lexus, nici mașini de lux, Uh, ce am văzut acolo, am văzut oameni speriați care veneau cu trenul, am învățat și eu mersul trenurilor pe de rost. De unde vin? Vine trenul de Sighet la anumită ori, de satul mare Sighet, la 7.20. Venea la 5.20 dimineața, era prima dată vatra Dornei. Trebuia să-i dai jos, să uh, Sigur, erau americanii foarte harnici, ei știau și limba uh, rusă și limba ucrainiană. Problema era după aceea în interacțiunea cu autoritățile române, pentru că erau acele corturi pe peronul gării, dacă mă țineți minte, la diferitelor instituții din România, cu doctori, cu femei de o anumită vârstă, care aveau tensiune 21, eu nu credeam că există tensiune 21, erau persoane care au bolnave de diabet, nu mai aveau medicament, erau persoane care, la Micolaev, a fost bombardată secția de oncologie, și a fost luată de pe targă și a fugit. Pur și simplu nu a avut timp să intre la operație. Avea cancer. Deci sunt niște, sunt niște lucruri incredibile care te emoționează teribil când, când uh, le treci. Deci eu n-am găsit nici Lexus-uri, nici... O să vă spun că cel puțin de două ori pe săptămână coborau de regulă din trenul de Chișinău. Trenul de Chișinău venea la două zile coborau uh, femei, uh, unele în vârstă, altele tinere, uh, de multe ori cu cățel în brațe, care după o săptămână, două la Chișinău, uh, încercau să se refugieze la București. Să știți că nu aveau nici măcar valize. Pentru noi, în Gara de Nord, era o mare greutate să cumpărăm valize. Pentru că veneau în saci de plastic cu lucrurile casele erau bombardate, atât a putut să, într-un sac de plastic, l-a pus în spate și a fugit de la Mariupol la Odessa. De acolo, cu autobuzul, a venit la București, la Filaret. De la Filaret au trimis-o la Gara de Nord, pentru că la Gara de Nord era un centru mai mare. Deci sunt cel puțin o mie de oameni în București care au dovedit empatie și care merită din păcate, numele lor nu sunt consemnate undeva, ei au fost extraordinari. Ei sunt prima față pe care au avut acești oameni disperați atunci când au coborât pe peronul Gării de Nord sau din autocare la Filaret. Și asta, al doilea lucru pe care vreau să-l spun, ar trebui să îi apreciem mai mult pe uh, concetățenii noștri, pe prietenii noștri din Basarabia. Ei au fost cei care primele luni au fost liantul, pentru că era limba. Dacă ei n-ar fi fost să intervină, să fie activi în gara de nord, în practic, deci cu mașini personale, îi luau din gara de nord, îi duceau la aeroport. Cu mașini personale, și eu cu mașina personală, i-am dus la nu, ambasada Canadei, unde trebuiau să încercau să obțină viză să plece în Canada sau le găseam autoritățile nu s-au comportat întotdeauna așa cum se spune acum, că a fost foarte bine n-a fost deloc bine comportamentul urât eu eram translator, n-am fost voluntar n-ar trebui să vorbesc despre lucrurile astea în care de translator, se presupune că translatorii păstrează o anumită discreție dar am auzit lucruri pe care n-am putut să le traduc ucrainienilor, am auzit lucruri de care mi-a fost rușine că un reprezentant al statului român le-a putut spune referitor la un refugiat ucrainian. Doi basarabenii, ar trebui să ne ridicăm, cum să spun, pălăria în față. Au fost extraordinari, au dovedit mai multă empatie decât am dovenit noi și ne-au facilitat, dacă vreți, contactul cu ucrainienii. Trei, 
Nu pot să nu spun un lucru care poate, sigur, de care de regulă nu se vorbește. Am fost în Ucraina acum 10 luni și am mers cu mașina și de la Jitomir spre Kiev era un sat. În satul respectiv era un cimitir. În cimitirul respectiv era singurul loc în care se întâmpla ceva. Era în perioada Paștelui, ceva de genul ăsta. Am oprit și am fost. Acel cimitir, jumătate din acel cimitir, erau morminte noi, proaspete. Deci pierderile înregistrate de Ucraina, cred că sunt uriașe, acei oameni au, s-au jerfit eroic pentru, probabil peste când se va termina războiul vom afla cât de mulți au plătit preț de sânge pentru a ține piept agresiunii Rusiei. Cam atât, cred că e cazul să nu, a, 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 altceva nu am oricum s-au spus foarte multe lucruri și mă bucur că Vlad Alexandruescu a organizat această întâlnire în această seară. Mulțumesc, Armand. Cred că am văzut o parte din problemele care se pun uh, foarte grave foarte omenești, uneori foarte simple, la care cred că trebuie să aducem răspunsuri. A fost poate un exercițiu de sinceritate, un exercițiu de transparență, pe care, iată, grupul pentru dialog social, împreună cu Expert Forum și cu revista 22, l-a încercat astăzi seară. Încă o dată e un prilej de doliu pentru acești doi ani de război, de pierderi de vieți omenești, de oameni tineri care au murit, au murit pentru libertate, au murit pentru democrație, au murit, de fapt, pentru Europa. Sper și eu că administrația românească va face mai mult pentru Ucraina, pentru refugiații ucraineni. Ei nu sunt doar o cifră, ei sunt niște persoane. Ei au niște nevoi, ei au niște copii, au nevoi psihologice care trebuie foarte bine înțelese în situația de față și dincolo de emoția pe care nu putem să ne încercăm în acest moment se află o serie întreagă de dosare depuse care se așteaptă rezolvarea. Mulțumesc excelență, mulțumesc reprezentanților ambasadei Statelor Unite, Poloniei, Mulțumesc reprezentanților Ministerului de Externe, Ministerului Muncii, mulțumesc organizațiilor care uh, au uh, făcut atâtea lucruri și fac în continuare atâtea lucruri pentru refugiații ucraineni, uh, mulțumesc membrilor GDS care au venit uh, astă seară, mulțumesc studenților, avem mulți studenți uh, care au venit să asculte această dezbatere și mă bucur foarte mult că au fost aici și că au auzit câte ceva, din felul în care uh, se pun pro problemele din punctul de vedere al uh, refugiaților ucraineni și a, al societății civile. Sperăm că mesajul către administrația publică românească a fost auzit. Vă mulțumesc tuturor și vă urez o seară bună!